First off, I want to thank you for being here today. And uh, I told Tanner that if he brought a guest, that Dennis would give him 50 bucks. <laughs> That's actually my wife. See her about that. <laughs> I didn't even know Tanner was dating anyone. <laughs> Uh, also, you could do a lot worse. I <laughs> also, I wanted to uh, mention that it's Valentine's Day is coming up uh, this Wednesday, I believe it is. And we want to wish every all you ladies a happy Valentine's Day. And I'll tell you a little story about that quickly. Uh, my grandmother was born on February 14th, and she was born in 1871, I believe it was. And uh, that was her birthday, and she even, throughout her lifetime, in that period of time, Jesse James stole a horse from her. Wow. <laughs> anyway. That's and, history. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of things happened back at that time. I also, I was going to tell you, too, before we get started, that um, there's a story told about a guy that was bear hunting, and he seen this bear... And he Here you go. is it not on. I forgot. Now it is. He seen this bear and he took a shot at it and he didn't hit the bear very hard, but uh, he started backing up and the bear started coming towards him on a charge. And as he's backing up, he stepped into a trap and fell down and he couldn't get away. And the guy says, "I sure hope that's a Christian bear." And the bear kept coming and. Just before it got to him, the bear dropped down on his front feet, put his head down, closed his eyes, and he thought, I'm getting out of this. And the bear was saying, Lord, thank you for the bounty you about, I'm about to receive. <laughs> anyway, the moral of that story is Christianity can be seen. You know, so, and so today we're going to finish up. I hope we'll finish up. We're talking about repentance and for... Uh, the folks that don't know, like Tanner and Carol, uh, we've been studying the plan of salvation. So today we'll be working on repentance, and uh, I will give you a couple little facts about that that we'll continue on with that. And I'm going to need some people to read, so get your Bibles ready, and um, we'll get into that. Seems like we never get enough, because... Um, Eric rings the bell on me before I get started. When we're talking about repentance, it would be no good if we didn't have anybody to help us once we did repent. In the story of the prodigal son, the prodigal son was in a pig pen, and he said, "I, I when he come to himself, he said, I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say, I've sinned against you in the earth and, and mankind. And he says, I'm going to say, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And then, so he heads towards his father, heading home. Of course, the parable of the father is of God. So when he gets to his dad's house and gets home, his father kills a fatted calf. And Dennis told the story very well last week, and most of you know the story. So the question is this, then. When did he repent? When he said, I'm going to do it? Or when he actually came in front of the Father? When he said he was going to do it? But, but, but the demonstration was when he came to the Father. Yeah, well, I, I think you could look at that two ways. He started going towards the Father, and that was a turnaround completely. But it wasn't true repentance until he faced his dad, who faced the Father, and then said... Father, I've sinned. You know, we a lot of times our thoughts, we're planning on doing something, we don't do them. But he headed that way, so he his repentance was going the right direction, but I don't think it was correct until he actually confessed and, and repented to the Father. So, knowing that then, repent, repentance brings about reconciliation, and that's reconciling man to God. Man has created and made sin and done sins. And so the reconciliation is between two parties and making it right. So our sin problem was our problem. And then God's problem was he wants everybody to be saved. Amen. 
So there's somewhere we got to have some reconciliation and make it right. And it means to renew and to start again. So whenever we repent of, of our sins, we're actually, we've turned around and we're renewing it. Once we've uh, uh, made reconciliation, once we've uh, confessed our sins, we're starting all over again. And also, we have to always remember, too, that repentance comes before forgiveness. And that's a very important fact. Matter of fact, I hadn't realized it, but over a period of time that uh, I had always took repentance just kind of for, for granted. You know, just as one of the steps. I just did it like that. And, but anyway, I found out that there's so much more to repentance and also that very little preaching is done on it. So I charge you to sure. come up with some good lessons sometime on that because I know that you, you do a great job. So also, so then since we are going to repent, then we need to know who we're repenting to. And the Bible says that I need somebody to read now. Who wants to read? Okay, Dennis, how about reading First John 2, 1 and 2? Somebody else read. Corey, how about reading... Uh, Romans, Romans eight twenty six through twenty eight, and and I'll get you the next. So let's get these other two. So we have we have this, and we have an advocate, in which is somebody that expresses what's going on with you to somebody else. So Jesus is recognized as that advocate. So you go ahead. First John two one and two. Yes. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Okay, so in the reading that Dennis just read, we said we have an advocate, and that's somebody that's going to speak on your behalf to Lord to Jehovah God. Amen. And he says that since we have that advocate, he's also a propitiation, and the propitiation means somebody that's going to appease God. God can't look on sin. God can't deal with sin. He doesn't want no part of sin, and no sinner's going to go into heaven or anything like that. So he's going to this propitiation is going to appease God. So we find out now that we got that happening. Corey, you want to read the next one? Romans eight twenty six. Yep. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so we find it here that not only does Jesus make intercession for us, but the Holy Spirit makes intercession. Mm -hmm. And we find out something else about the Holy Spirit. He says when we... When we utter groanings and stuff and we don't know what we're saying and we can't get it out right or we stumble through with our prayers and stuff, the Holy Spirit will go to God and he gets it right when he talks to God right. about you. So we have Jesus talking to God about you. We have the Holy Spirit talking to you with, uh, about talking to God about you. And we have these people that are wanting you to be saved. We have these people that want you to return to God. And the Bible says, as we looked last week, it says that in heaven there's more, if, if one sinner comes forward, that the angels in heaven rejoice over that. And we said, that's a big deal. It is. It is a big deal. So let's get a couple more readings and then don't do it yet. Well, I'll tell you when. Okay, there. Okay, let's get some more readers. Who wants to read? Okay, Brenda, how about reading... This is a good one here. I want to do this one. How about Acts 3.19? Who else wants to read? Okay, Tony. Uh, how about reading Acts 8.21 and 22? Somebody else. Herschel. 
Acts 17, 30, and 31. And then let's get those, and then, I'll, oh, Dennis, okay, I'm, sure. I'll get you to Acts 30. All right, Dennis, how about Acts 26, 20? Okay, okay. let's do those, and then we'll, we'll get out there. So, Brenda, I think you were first with Acts 3, 19. Okay, let's roll. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times... Uh, the refreshing may come from the pres presence of the Lord. Okay, so it says that the times of refreshing will come through the Lord, and it also says there that that uh, we need to follow God. So the times of refreshing is talking about there that if you had some spoiled fruit and you threw it away, but if you had a something you could make that new again, like how many of you have had an orange and it gets all that old gray stuff on the side and it gets... It looks like a piece of dirt. If you have something you can inoculate it with and then get it back like that, that's kind of what was going on with us. We're covered with filthy, dirty sins, and then we have these people, that, these beings that are working on our behalf, and then if we repent, then that color comes back, or that, that back to the original. So let's get the next Who had the next reading? Who had the next one? T Tony, go ahead, Tony. I think it was Acts 17, 30, and 31, was it? No, it's Acts 8, 21. Yeah, that's the one it was. You have neither part nor not nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Okay, so in, in Acts... Uh, 8, 21, and 22, the thoughts of your heart. You know, repentance, a lot of times, as I mentioned this before, you'll get an evil thought, an uh, uh, unclean thought, thought in your head. And repentance, that can get forgiven by being repenting of it. But here's the thing of it. Sometimes you don't even know that that's going to happen. For example... I have a problem if I watch a cowboy show and somebody gets shot and I go to bed that night, somebody's getting shot in my dreams. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that happens. And so you, you just can't, it, you don't want it to happen, but it happens. And so the thoughts of our hearts, it's something we have to work on. We did talk about that before that, you know, it says, think on these things, what's pure, holy, and all that. Think of those things. But sometimes them other thoughts still creep in. You know, something will happen and it still creep in. So we just, the Bible says if we repent, we'll be converted against, and those evil thoughts will be forgiven of us if we do that. Okay, who had the next reading? It was uh, Acts 17, 30 and 31, I believe it was. Wasn't it? Acts 30, 31? Yeah. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Okay, in that reading there, it says that He's appointed a day which that man, and that's Jesus, will judge the world. That day is already set. Mm -hmm. It's not something that if he's going to wishy-washy around about. It's not, God's not going to like that. If he's appointed a day, that's when it's going to happen. And nothing is going to change that. So whenever he decides to send his archangel and every eye will see him, that day has already been established. So and the reason God could do that, because God knows everything. So he's appointed that day when he's going to do that. And he said, since he's appointed a day, he said, what kind of person should we be, be knowing that eventually this world's going to be burned up? And eventually you're going to stand before a living God. You're going to be judged by Jesus. And we do know that there's not three places to go. There's only two. It's heaven and hell. And so... We got to say, knowing that, what manner of person should we be? I think a lot of people have the idea, well, I'll wait, and 
uh, about a week before I pass, hmm. I get really good and pray a lot and get right with the Lord. You know, I'll tell you a story. We have we had a friend of ours, and this guy had pancreatic cancer. His name was Carlos Gerald, and Carlos was a good moral man. I mean, he took care of his family. He had about 1,200 people working out under him. Wow. He was a big supervisor over in Ford's over here. And anyway, he went through his life, good moral person, but he didn't go to church, and I talked to him about it numerous times. His wife was a faithful member, and his child was, one of them was a preacher, and but he just didn't want to have anything to do with it. So, the, getting the last few days of his life, I was down to the hospital to see him, and he said, uh, we, we were talking, and I said, Carlos, what about if we talk to you about baptism, being baptized? And he knew that death was inevitable for him. It's coming. And he said, and this, is, this, this phrase he said was something that haunts you all your life. He says, well, he said, I didn't follow the Lord all the days of my life. And he said, this last three or four days I've got, I'm not going to change. And he said, and follow him now. I said, that'd be hypocritical. <laughs> I thought to myself, boy, you know, you're choosing to go to hell and because of vanity. So we got to remember those things. Okay, the, the, is there somebody else had a reading? Was it? Yes. Uh, is it Acts? Acts. 20, was it 20. Acts 26? Yes, 20? and verse 20. Okay. Yeah, I think that was what. Let's I, try Acts 26, 20. I think that's it. Okay. But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem. Okay, and, wait a minute. So it's, it's telling you they're going to declare the gospel so that you know what you have to do as far as repentance. Go ahead, Dennis, sorry. I and didn't throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that oh. they should repent. Okay, wait a minute now. So, John started preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus started from Jerusalem, and this is how we know it's an accurate account. Jesus started preaching, repent for the kingdom is at hand. And, of course, the kingdom is the church. The church and kingdom are synonymous. Jesus is saying the kingdom is going to be established real soon. When Jesus was in his last year of his ministry, he had the Passover supper, and that was uh, in the first month of, 15th day of the first month of the new year. Forty days later, he had, he had, was crucified before that, and then he was on the earth for 40 days, and then he went to heaven. So, whenever he went to heaven, he put this in the effect that we should repent and put the plan of salvation into effect. So go ahead, Dennis, i got one more. That they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Okay, now that's, that's one thing I wanted to stress. Do works worthy of repentance. Now let's see. Suppose, in the case of that bear I told you, he been down and prayed, thank you for this bounty. So he, he did something worthy of that prayer. So if we're repenting for something, let's just say, for example, I steal cars, good cars. I steal them and I repent from it, and I'm going to keep the car. Is that repentance? No, not repentance. So repentance then comes with doing the right thing and proof of repentance. Suppose, let's just say, uh, I have an out with one of my brothers here, and, and, and I say, I'm sorry for that, I repent of that, and then I don't, and I still treat him like a foe, like an enemy, like that. That's not visible repentance. That's right. You know, repentance is visible. Now, in the case in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, as Paul writes, it says, it's reported commonly that um, one of your members has his father's wife. And Paul says, even though I'm not there, I judge that person. And he said, withdraw from that person. He said, so he 
In 2 Corinthians, he writes, I'm so glad, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm so glad that because you followed up with his instruction that the man received the words that he was encouraged to and he put away that sin. So that was visible, visible repentance. Let's say uh, another thing. Suppose, suppose I was a heavy drinker and I, I staggered into church and I sit down over there and Dennis was preaching and I'm mumbling or something. Doesn't really matter. But suppose those things happen and I come forward and say, I repent. And if I come back the next week and I'm still like that, I'm still stumbling around. I didn't repent. I said something, but I didn't do it. So it's visible. Repentance is visible. It's just like, I get right with you. It's just like being baptized. You can't be baptized in secret. God knows it, and the the preacher that baptized you know it. Christianity is a visible, visible way of following God. When you pray, it's visible. When you pray at night, it's visible. When you talk to people, it's visible. You know, your actions, it's all visible. So whenever we repent, that's how we can let people know that we repented. Go ahead, Corey. I kind of want to push back a little bit on your last comment because you said if someone is drunk and then they repent and they get drunk again, it wasn't really repentance. I don't, I don't know that that's necessarily the case because the idea that you're never going to sin again once you repented, I don't, I don't know that that's exactly how it works. I, I think if you struggle with something, there's a distinct possibility that you might struggle again in the future, right? And mm-hmm. So we, I think you can, and tell me if I'm wrong, but that you could repent from a sin more than once, or that if you're struggling yeah, with something, yeah, you, you it's can. not as if you're cured of that sin, right? Yeah, it's, you can. And, and also, and the example of uh, you know, Peter comes to Jesus and said, how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus and says, seven times 70? Seven times 70, 490 times? And the idea is that as often as he repented, you forgive him. And that's what God is doing. We've committed millions of sins, millions of them. If we had books, they would be overwhelming. But God continues to forgive us of those sins, but we have to repent of them. Go ahead. You yeah, and, and just a comment. You know, it, that's a very good point you make because only God knows the heart when that person drunk decides to repent. Uh, and it may be that all that week he was fine, and then that Saturday night, early Sunday morning, got bad news, drank, came back, in fact, probably will again confess his sin. But there probably are cases where people, you know, uh, whether it's drunkenness or fornication or lying or whatever, they come before the church and say, I repent, I'm sorry, forgive me, and I ask God's forgiveness. And this, not a frequent thing, but on occasion, I think some people will do that to, to ease their conscience, but they know they're going to go right back to it. Uh, and they just, I mean, let me change that. Not just know, actually plan to. In other words, if you were to ask them, you're their best friend, say, now, you plan to go back to that bottle? Oh, yeah, I'll probably be drinking by the end of the day. I can't give up that stuff. Again, that's the exception, but there, that's probably happened. And, and in that example Joe gave, we would assume that would be the case, that that person had a tinge of conscience, decided to repent, but right afterwards, no, I'm, I'm going right back to it. And that would be the problem. Mm-hmm. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to have about five minutes. We're going to get done. <laughs> Okay, I got a couple more scriptures I'd like to get somebody to read. Okay, Dennis, how about you? We'll get one from you. Uh, how about reading Romans two verse five? Somebody else, uh, Corey. How about Second uh, Corinthians seven verses eight, nine, and ten? Somebody else. Okay, I'll get Second uh, Corinthians. No, Second Peter three nine, ten, and eleven. 2 Peter 3, 9, 10, and 11. We'll get those going, then we'll get somebody else. Romans 2, verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and impenitent heart, 
You are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And then also, let's get the other, we'll get all those readings, then I'm going to make some comments. Go ahead. Uh, Corey, was you next? Yes, yeah, so 2 Corinthians 7, <laughs> verses 8 through 10. Yeah. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us as nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Okay. Did I sign one more? Yeah. Yeah. Can you have someone back here? Herschel, did you have one? Go. Second Peter 3, 9, 10, and 11. Yep. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will, be, will become as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Thank you. The reading that was just read uh, in Romans 2 and verse 5 that Dennis read, it said that in, in penitence, that means somebody that does not repent. In Luke 13, 3, the Bible says, except you repent, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that's a very critical part of the plan of salvation. So an uh, impenitent heart, that's somebody that has their heart so set on they're not going to change. The example I told you about Carlos Gerald, that was an impenitent heart. Great man, good guy. He was like Cornelius in the Bible, but he wasn't saved. So that impenitent heart. And then when the one Corey read was... Um, 2 Corinthians 7, 8, 9, and 10. It said, talking about being sorry. Now when the congregation, and this is a story here in 1 Corinthians 5 and then in 2 Corinthians, when this congregation obeyed what Paul said, and not what Paul said per se, it's what the Bible said. When they obeyed what the Bible said, then what happens is they were a little bit unsure of how this is going to turn out. And they, they were looking at the idea that, you know, we're really sorry we're going to have to do that. But they did do what the Bible said to do. And it, and it said godly sorrow leads to repentance. So when the man came back in 2 Corinthians and following that, the church was made joy again. And it says godly sorrow works to repentance. So sometimes whenever we think about if we have a, a religious background, if we have the idea we want to follow God, sometimes whenever we get ready to do something or have done something, we thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we get ready to do something, a little voice inside says, You shouldn't do that. You know, and we, we get that. Like I've been to some place, and I'm sure many of you were that maybe it was a convention or something of that nature, and, and everybody's having a drink, and somebody says, oh, have one. And that little boy says, no, you can't do that. I mean, you're a Christian. You can't do that. So that little voice is a help, but that little voice, the way you get that voice is reading the Bible because it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So our faith increases that. Let me just hurry. So in uh, that godly sorrow that we have, it's something that the more we read, the more we want to do right. And I've right. said this illustration before. When I was young, my dad would, if I did something wrong, he had a big belt and he would use it. He didn't mind using it. 
But when he did, you know, I did things that I needed punished for. But what also happens is I did things that he wanted me to do that I didn't do. Well, whenever I got older, I didn't. He didn't need the belt. I did things that he wanted me to do because I loved him. Mm -hmm. And that love then, and that's the way it is with God. When you first start out, you kind of do things that, that, you know, a little contrary to God, but as the more you get into God, the more that Jesus, you realize Jesus died for your sins, the more that you recognize that we have an advocate with the Father and all those things, and we have um, Hebrews chapter 11, the great race where everybody's saying, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. When we think about the saints that's going on before I know that I talked a lot today. So thank you for being here. And once again, come back and be with us again. Thank Tanner and, and get your 50 bucks. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Very nice, Joe.